Yep. Okay. Thank you. And so we have very bright student, but then at this, uh, and the real realize that you know we uh, we uh, you guys don't have as much opportunity as university student to participate in under, undergrad research. So this was a really important piece that was missing. And so we thought that, hey, you know what? Why not do this, right? Because this all this student right here, they would benefit so much and they'll be learning to be able to expand the learning so much uh, by doing undergrad research. And so we hope that this program would add a lot of value to you and that otherwise community college, many, many community college are basically lacking, okay? And so currently right now, we, well, let me actually, uh, so read a little bit, few things about this program right here. Okay, so here a basically brief uh, description about this program right here. And so, uh, um, uh, well, I don't think I'm gonna be reading all of this closely, but well, maybe I do focus on a few things. So we support student learning by providing various research opportunity for students to bridge classroom education to actual application. And our program is suitable for both beginner and advanced chemistry students, like those of you taking organic chemistry right now. And so if you choose to participate in this program, you will work closely with a faculty mentor on many exciting uh, projects that they have established or will be establishing. Because sometimes we also take student idea if you come to us and you say, I have a good idea, this idea that I want to try out. Then, and you talk to your professor, and then if your professor approve it, then we can also be working on your project as well. So you can propose your own idea and have work on your projects, okay? And so, and finally, you will then have many opportunities to showcase your research finding at research seminar. And in the past, we have sent students to several national research seminars as well, like the ACS. And uh, we have also sent students to UC Davis to present their research on the annual research seminar as well. So many exciting opportunities. Um, um, so there you go. Okay. Now, our program, I mean, we, um, uh, we are not, I would say, not the most, not the wealthiest program around and funding for us is a, in a way is quite limited, but we are actually very fortunate to have very supportive administrator that whenever we come to them, if it's reasonable, then they will try their best to get us the money that we need. So right now, I don't think that we have any uh, problem getting the equipment that we need for our research and getting the chemical reagent. So we're very, we are very fortunate for that. Okay, and here are some of the research professor that are, will be doing undergrad research this semester. So first we have Professor Dr. Tanya Askin, and perhaps maybe you can raise your hand and say hi to the student, huh? And you have me, and Hello. my name is Vin Dow. And we have Professor Miller, so Professor Miller, go ahead and say hi to them. Hello. And we have Professor Stewart. Everyone. Yeah. And lastly, we have Professor Julian Hosage. Hello. And I don't know if you guys noticed this or not, but a lot of us got our PhD from UC Davis. Huh? So we are very, very local, with the exception of Professor Stewart from Howard University. Am I right? Yeah? Okay. Now, so who are you? Who are the students that we are, are inviting to join this program right here? Then first of all, um, you know, we, Ideally speaking, we would like to invite students who are major in one of the STEM field, right? Because we do an research in science. So ideally speaking, it would be a STEM student. And you have to be motivated and interested in learning through research. So, okay, and hopefully uh, that's the reason why that many of you are here today. And you also have some background on the area that you wish to research by either having taken or will be taken appropriate courses relating to the research interest. Now, but this is really not a big deal at all because you know once students start working on certain research project that they're interested in, it allow them to uh, have opportunity to learn more about all this field right here on their own. So this is actually not a big deal at all. So you don't have to have strong background in any area at all because that is something that you will be learning about. Okay, and so you will be receiving grace. And in this case right here, listed at Chem 484, you can also be signed up for another class that I forgot to put, Chem 484. 
and it called on a chemistry. Okay, and you can get a letter grade for it, which can be helpful for you, and it also get you credit, uh, transferable credit. Okay, so uh, one student decided to join our program, you guys will be enrolled in Chem 484 with the title Honor Chemistry. Okay. And now what are student responsibility? So here are some a list of student responsibility right here. So make sure you work closely with your research advisor to thoroughly understand all aspects of the projects. And also with your advisor to make sure that the appropriate equipments are available for experiments. So this basically requires coordination between you and the professor, okay? And we also want you to, basically we want, we want to provide you with a real deal of what a research experience would be. So therefore, you know, if we also want you to look up chemical reagent and equipment that you need and then be able to order them and get some basic order information. So that's something very basic that graduate students need to be able to do. So we want you to be able to have that same experience, okay? And next, be willing to spend about three to five hours per week doing literature research, okay? And I would say more hours doing the experiment. Now, I actually need to perhaps maybe change this a little bit more. Okay, our requirement is a student need to be able to spend three hours per week, that's the minimum, not the minimum, okay? And the reason why, because this class right here, uh, if when you sign up for the CAM 484 or the CAM 495, um, then it would be it required three hours minimum. But a lot of time, you know, if you're just spending three hours per week, then it may not be enough to accomplish anything, right? So student would actually be, uh, will be spending even more time now, now, this is the time that we'll be happy, students will be happy to spend that. Uh, and a lot of students end up spending more time because they're so passionate about it and they don't even count the time anymore because that's what it takes in order to get something done. Okay. And so I just want to say that in the past, we did observe students spending up to 20 hours per week to do research, depending on the student availability. And now we do not require this of every student, but then we require that you be committed and have a minimum of at least three hours per week to do some experiment and meeting with your research professor, okay? And then toward the end of the semester or in the future, they, uh, there may be research meeting and research seminars that we'll have, and we want you to participate in those events, okay? And lastly, safety is important. So it is your responsibility to follow with your professor and talk to your professor and make sure that, well, that everything that we do will be set for everyone, okay? And now I wanted to also mention that there is an application. Normally, um, so this is the application right here in case you are interested. If this one page application, we make it very, very, very easy. And so basic name and now, uh, later on, each professor will have an opportunity to talk about their projects. And then if you're interested, you know, listen to all the project and see what interests you. And once you know, okay, I'm interested in this project, then sign up to do research with that particular professor. Okay, so that's how this sign up process is, is. So you'll be putting the check into whichever professor name that you are interested in working with, uh, with him or her, okay? and some basic information down here. And now this last part right here is perhaps maybe something that we're thinking of, 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 uh, of meeting this semester, faculty recommendation, because in the past, we do want students to be recommended by another uh, for, uh, faculty member, because to vouch, to vouch for you that you are dedicated and so on. But we understand that with COVID, it may be difficult for you to get in touch with your other professor that would vouch for you. So we'll go ahead and go ahead and skip this portion for now. And so we want you to also include a copy of your unofficial transcript, okay? Because we wanted to know what classes that you are taking and how have you been doing in your group and so on. And so the um, uh, joining this undergrad research program right here is based on acceptance. So not anyone apply will get accepted, but we'll try our best to accept as many students as we possibly can. And the reason why is because uh, we don't have unlimited amount of resources that we can do this with everyone, okay? And so therefore, and for some of you, you know, even though you're very passionate about undergrad research, but maybe the timing, maybe this semester might not be the best semester. If you take like five classes right now, then we say, hey, maybe you should wait until next semester. 
because the goal of this undergrad research program is to help you enhance your learning, right? But if you are so busy to, because you take a lot of classes, then that is when it's more important for you to focus on your classes rather than research, okay? So that's the reason why that we want to be looking at your transcript so we can see, okay, this is a good solid choice and we should be providing the opportunity to this particular student. Okay, but our whole goal is to make sure to be able to provide opportunity for everyone. So don't think that you're not going to get accepted. Be sure to apply. Okay. And, and so this is the app application and the email right here. And so once you know who you're interested in, check the box and email your applications uh, to the professor directly. Because in the past, I will be, we have a coordinator who will be gathering all of the application. But this semester, we're going to change things around a little bit. Please email the professor directly. Okay? So quite a very, very easy application. Are there any questions about our undergrad research program? Uh, where can you find the application? Where Hello? can you find the application? That is a great question. So I will go ahead and I, I think that I'm not going to be able to email all of you, huh? unless, but, uh, so what I will do now is I will put this in the chat message. I will upload that into the chat message so you guys can download it. So I think that will be the easiest way, okay? And so I will do that in a little bit. So thank you. That's thank you. Questions. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, people typing in the chat. There was a question in the chat, okay. Yeah, I asked, um, is honors chem required with chem 495? Uh, so it not require. So you'll be either, you'll be enrolling chem 484, or chem uh, 495, one of that class. And so right now for this semester, what happened is we will be enrolling everybody in chem 484. And so basically the courses for this class right here, there are a few options, few courses that we can have students take. And in this case right here, the 484 uh, would be the most appropriate one for this semester. And it called order chemistry. And you'd be getting one unit and a letter grade. Is this something that can be, um, assuming acceptance, of course, um, is this something that can be done multiple semesters or is this like a single semester deal? Great questions. This can be a single semester, but ideally speaking, we want students who can make a longer commitment than that. So once you get accepted into this semester, and we would very much like to see students who can continue and work on the same project in next semester. Because sometimes it takes, it takes years, uh, it, it takes like several semesters, it takes some time to be able to complete and get in some useful data. So yes, we want students who can stay and be committed for a few semester. But I would say even if one semester, that's good too, okay? Thank you for that question. Uh, uh, you know, so Professor Miller and Pro Professor Askin and Professor Devon and Jose, uh, please feel free to add in, you know, if I miss out on certain things, uh, please, uh, please, you know, feel free to comment in, okay? You're doing a great job, Ben. Thank you. I agree. I have very supporting faculty. That was my that was my input. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So who uh, now? So um, if there's no other question, then I would then turn this over to the professors to talk about their project. And but, Bill, Bill, would it be? I know that you signed on as host, but is it okay if I go first because I have another meeting at three thirty? I think we can all be hosts, can't we? Oh, can we? I'm going to say, yeah. Uh, I cannot make you host. It doesn't. Oh, work. oh, can I just share though my PowerPoint? Yeah, I, I think you should be able to share. So perhaps now we can move yeah. on into Professor Tanya asking first. Yeah. And then Thank after you. that, yeah, uh, for, for the professor who would like to go next, because I know that we all have different time commitment for today. So if there's anyone who's busy, they have to go first. I, my, my kind of talk attached a little bit to Tanya's, so I could go not ask him, so I could probably tell, tell okay. it, won't, it would be just a few minutes. Okay, 
So I, I, I can go last. So I don't mind going last. I can go last too. Oh. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill thank you. and Julian. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So I would stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Professor Askin. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. Undergraduate research. All right. So um, now many of you uh, may be interested, maybe some for extra credit, but there's some practical benefits for doing undergraduate research. Getting more units, helping your GPA, looks great on your resume. Great networking with the professors and other staff at the college and your peers, and also a great way to get reference letters and recommendations for when you want to move on um, to different um, colleges, uh, universities. Um, there are more benefits, additional benefits that you can also gain. You can conduct hands on research and again work directly with the faculty members and just gain a deeper understanding of research. And you know, once that door opens, it wasn't until I started doing undergrad research that I really learned, hey, I really love this and I want to pursue a graduate degree. So it, it exposes you to research and kind of guides you to your career path as well, or what you want to do in grad school. And um, it'll also help you with your presentation skills. We're going to have, you can have group meetings with us and you are going to present you know what you've done so it helps that skill uh leadership it also helps you become more of a leader and also helps with jobs you get experience doing undergraduate research and it can help you get some entry-level jobs and of course if you're applying for graduate school you already have a flavor for this and you have more of an idea of what you want to do in grad school now two projects that i'm interested in this semester and many semesters is cannabis chemistry and water analysis. So I'm going to talk about cannabis chem chemistry first, followed by the water analysis. Now, um, the cannabis ch chemistry is going to be in collaboration with Dr. Dow. And um, really, I want to kind of go talk about cannabis a little bit. I'm very interested in the, this research. It's a really fast growing field. And, you know, Cannabis has been around a very long time, like 10,000 years, they used hemp to produce cord. And you can see um, in the 1800s, marijuana was starting to be used in mainstream medicine. Now, what happened though, is that after some time, it started to have um, controls placed on that substance. And in 1970, it became part of a schedule one drug which means that they, at the time, they said it's not gonna have any medical use, but we know now that's not true. And that really stemmed back in 1937 when they did the Marijuana Tax Act. Really what historians know that it was due to overt racism, there's racism tied to this, and there were political reforms, Democrats had their, uh, or not just bureaucrats, <laughs> forgive me, had their own self-interest. That was like a really bad thing to say. And what happened was, is that if you've noticed when from the 30s to the 70s, then it became um, that, or the 70s, it became a schedule one drug. So there wasn't a lot of research that was done on cannabis. And what we know about the 90s, researchers started looking at the NIH at the cannabinoids, uh, this compound in marijuana, and it found that, okay, it had some effect on our receptor system. And then in 1996, California, California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana. And now skip to 2021, now 36 states are allowing for medical use and 18 states in Washington DC are permitting adult recreational use. Now, here is just a map to kind of um, give you an idea of the state regulated um, cannabis programs. But here you can see a lot of this dark green, we have um, adult and medical use um, programs here. And there's really only three states right now with no public cannabis access programs. But why this is important is this is why the, the field, um, the chemistry behind this is growing so much. Because actually, because there's not been a lot of research, cannabis is a really um, exciting and challenging compound to analyze. So it needs analytical testing 
Now, food and natural products are a great starting point. There's a lot of research on that. But cannabis itself is really unique. It has like 500 compounds not found in any other plants or animals. Um, it, it has a high lipid and fat content with low moisture. Um, and I won't go into all these details, but you can see it has a lot of substances within, um, its, within that plant. So when you're talking about um, production now, because it's used recreationally and medically, well, how are we going to produce this safely and reliably? So that requires a lot of analysis. And we want to make, and this is especially true for dosing and for regulatory limits now, and especially for the cost, right? So if they're saying there's a certain concentration in there, we want to make sure that they're delivering that concentration. Now, what is analyze, analyzed? Like I showed on the previous slide, there's lots of different things to be analyzed. And the cannabinoid part analysis, you can analyze THC, hemp, CBD, among a lot of other compounds. Okay, and how would we do that? Well, you're gonna use analytical chemistry. So analytical chemistry, it uses instruments to um, separate, identify, and quantify matter. So we'll be using instruments like HPLC, GCMS, and the role of analytical chemistry is vast. So you can ensure uh, consumer safety, you wanna optimize cultivation practices, and of course, design and develop uh, marijuana products. Now, the variety of products are, is just staggering, right? There's lots of different marijuana products in the market now. You have CBD, right? So this it doesn't get you high. This is um, not the psychoactive form, but a lot of folks are taking this for medical reasons. Now, they also have THC capsules, chocolate, caramel corn, gummies, tinctures, lotions, salvages, beverages, and there's even more out there. But because there's all these different products, you have a lot of unique challenges to extract and get accurate analyses um, with all of these different types of products. So again, one of the fastest growing industries, we want to research testing methods using our instrumentation to look for contaminants, right? And then also analytical techniques for working on extracting, separating, and testing cannabis products or surrogate cannabis products, okay? So that's really uh, one of uh, my passions is to really uh, get into this type of research. Now, uh, another research project. I won't be as long with this one for time, but this is in collaboration with Dr. Stewart. And it's about water analysis. Now, water analysis is really important. Like We need to know what is in our drinking water and other sources as well. But 63 million Americans were exposed to unsafe drinking water, right? And unclean water can cause serious and costly issues. And this is disproportionately affecting poor and minor minority communities across our country. Now, what, we, what I wanna do is test local drinking water, other resources like the American River and various bottled water. And things that we would look for would be looking for pH, total dissolved solid hardness, iron, to be, and there's more as well that I'm interested in looking at. And really um, I'm wanting to develop a lab for our chemi general chemistry class. So any work we do could be um, incorporated into a lab that will benefit students in general chemistry as well. And that's all I have. So, and did you wanna say a couple of things? Sorry, everyone, <laughs> seemed kind of rushed. I was like all excited. No, yeah, uh, thanks Dr. Atkins. So, I, I didn't put together a presentation today uh, because I'm really uh, doing a very, very, very small group recruitment. So this, this water analysis project is going to be the larger um, part of the, the, the group. And I also have another project uh, that I'm looking for at least another student, one or two other students to, to help work on. And it's on air quality, just to kind of give you a, a backdrop as to my group. Previously, it was a pretty large group uh, with a, a lot of students from um, computer science um, background to students who are majoring in mechanical engineering. And so the group had two projects that they were working on. The first one, which before COVID happened, they were making quite 
a number of, uh, they, they actually made quite uh, impressive progress on was to develop a low cost air quality sensor. And the idea behind this was that we could create something that is really cheap and you could put it outside of your home or in your bedroom and it will be counting the pollutants that are around, um, ozones and particles, all of these things that are linked to um, health impacts. And they made a really great progress with that. I was searching for some pictures as we speak, but I'm going to have to tap them again to send over some photographs. So we have a prototype of that. We've gotten to the point where we're counting particles, we are measuring gas, uh, there's a GPS on it. Um, the challenge was to make it so that it is powered by solar. So it was about attaching you know, the solar panel to it so we could just leave it somewhere and it will count pollutants for a while. It's supposed, it's meant to be low cost. And the, the idea behind that is um, we could turn that into a cure, which is a, um, you know, research based activity that can be incorporated into environmental science courses at the undergraduate level, right? So students will actually learn how to make these things and actually count different particles from, from various sources. So I have that project. The second project that I have is um, one that happens in cloud. So cloud, a cloud chemistry project. And the idea behind that is one, one, when we burn, um, and we emit stuff from, we, you know, we're in California, so we have a lot of fire, forest fires and uh, we have a lot of emissions from cars. They actually emit compounds. And those compounds under sunlight and humidity can actually undergo some pretty complex chemistry and they can form compounds that absorb light, right? And so what happens is when these compounds that are formed actually land on the surface of ice or land in lakes and waters and stream, they actually, research has shown that they actually affect the temperature of the waterways and they can actually affect marine and aquatic life because they can be toxic and they're also toxic to human health as well. So that's the project that I'm really looking for, maybe another one or two students on because, and in total transfer, I'm going to let you know. Um, so I have a collaboration with a scientist in Croatia. Uh, one of my research students in 2019 was able to go to Croatia and work in the lab with those scientists. So we, I'm really trying to build that pipeline with them. Um, the student is now at UC Davis. Uh, I think they even got a pretty wonderful scholarship at UC Davis to continue uh, doing this type of work that students really got a lot of um, hands-on experience. So uh, I'm really looking for a small group because the hope is if, if you guys, uh, we can talk about it, but you, that student was able to pay most of their, their, their resources. But if you want that opportunity, my plan too is to go to Croatia uh, this summer. And I would really want another student who would be able to go and help us make some measurements on some pretty complicated measurements that we can't do at the community college level on surface tension and observant property. So that, that project, all I would want the student to do is to come in and help me to make these compounds this semester so we can package them up and ship them off to Croatia. And then if the student can or cannot join me in Croatia, depends on how your resources are, uh, then I would go, we'll take the measurement and, and we'll work on that. So I'm really looking for a very small group, um, really committed to learning the skill set and learning how to do that. And if, if you're interested in either one of those projects, I, I'm still in contact with the students who have been working on those um, projects so they can um, you know, really share their experience in the group. So that's, that's what I, I have to add. But the bulk of the students, I would expect that they would go towards the water quality lab. That's it, thank you. Okay, so thank you.
And is it my turn next or Professor say you would like to go? I don't mind going. Okay, so for me, okay, so I guess that would be my turn again to talk about some of the projects that uh, I'm interested in. So I'm actually have been known to be quite ambitious and that is actually my problem. I have a lot of ideas and a lot of time. I don't have enough time to do all of them, but then uh, that's my issue. <laughs> I have lots of ideas. So these are some of the projects that I am uh, looking for students to help uh, work on, okay? And because that there's so many ideas that by myself, I can't do them all. So this is why that um, uh, I'm looking for quite uh, a little bit more students. But I'm looking for people who are very, very committed in a way. And the reason why, because you're going to be in charge of this project, this will be yours. And, and, and we're going to be working very closely together. But I want you to be, to be owning this project right here. Okay. And we'll work closely together. And this is some of the projects I'm working on right now. So the first project is a design and synthesis of peptide drugs targeting Alzheimer's disease. And this is a continuation of my uh, PhD work at from UC Davis. And so basically through in my, um, during my uh, graduate study, we, um, I designed a class of peptides that were quite effective in, um, and were able to neutralize the toxicity that, um, that, give, that basically are been hypothesized to be the cause of Alzheimer's disease. So they, this class of protein that they call the amyloid protein and the formation of that amyloid plaque is what has been um, proposed to be causing Alzheimer's disease. And of course, there are newer theories that were established recently, but then uh, according to one of the hypothesis, uh, the long hypothesis, then it due to this um, amyloid plaque right here. And so in my project, we designed drugs that would target this amyloid plaque right here that are known to be toxic to neuron. So, and so what we did with that, we take this uh, amyloid plaque and we grow cell, we actually culture cell and neuron cell in the lab. And we treat them with this amyloid plaque and we see that they were very toxic uh, to, a, for, for, to a neuron. And then we take our peptide that we synthesize and we add that into that mixture. And we saw, we observed that now having the peptide that we added in, it helped cells survive. And it basically by reducing the toxicity of this amyloid plaque. And so this research right here um, has been quite successful. And we, it, it, and I do have a collaborator for, for, uh, a, a, from all the way from Hungary. And so uh, a very big research group on Alzheimer's disease. And so they were the one that actually helped us doing some of the cell testing and the animal testing. So basically, I am looking to for someone who would help continue this project right here. And to be honest, this has project with the first project that we got started. And for the past two years, then we didn't have anyone to work on it. So there's a lot of work that needs to be continued. Okay. And the second project that I have is a DNA binding peptide projects. And basically, because you know, uh, so I'm sure that from maybe from biology, you may may have learned about genes expression. Right, and so I mean, uh, certain genes get expressed, and not the expression of, of not of some of most protein are good for you because it's supposed to happen, so you can have the right proteins to stay alive, right? But sometimes there's certain expression of certain uh, of protein that are not ideal and therefore harmful. So what we want to do is we want to study the interactions, uh, look at the structure of DNA and see if we can rationally design peptides based on the DNA sequence that will come in and bind to that DNA segment or that gene that we're interested in based on the sequence. So basically the peptide we design will be specific. And we know that we can achieve this because this is actually how our body does it. Our body has big protein that can recognize each gene with high specificity, right? And so therefore we hope that now can we do this with something that is, that is smaller. And so based on the, so let's say we look at this gene right here and this is the DNA sequence for this gene. Then now we're gonna design the corresponding peptide that will bind that specifically. And hopefully that will be able to inhibit that gene from being expressed or doing certain things. Now, so the application for this is actually huge 
if successful, we will be looking at a potentially, uh, you know, I would say Nobel Prize, right? Clearly not easy, but you can see I'm actually quite ambitious. Uh, I either don't do it or I do something very big. And, you know, big things are not always easy to achieve, right? But uh, that's the whole idea, okay? Uh, and so the next peptide that I have is a called an antimicrobial and anti-cancer peptide. So in, and this project right here will actually stem from the first project, the project with Alzheimer's. So what happened was that in that first project with Alzheimer's, as we were doing some cell testing, right? We discovered that, with the, that our peptide were very effective in killing cancer cells. Because we test them on cancer cells, and then it turned out one of the peptide that we put in, it was so toxic for the cancer cell that it killed them all. And it was even more toxic than the amyloid plaque that we were hoping our peptide would protect, protect against. So our, our peptide turned to be so toxic. And now it's only toxic to a cancer cell, but not normal neuron. And this is when we observed this data, first of all, we were quite wondering what's, what's going on. And then later on, when we analyzed text this again, and, and we were so excited in this because now we found something that was so effective in killing cancer. So hopefully, and so basically we're in the process of perhaps maybe studying more about the activity and the function of this peptide. So see if we can further improve its efficiency. And if it all works, then you know what? We could be treating cancer. And hopefully that get gonna get us another Nobel Prize, right? So there you go. And the uh, next projects, um, the, um, the, the fourth project is wine analysis. You know, I make wine, I love drinking wine. And so I like to do some analysis of wine. And this can be a great skill for you to, to in, be able to take your, the chemistry that you have learned, how to do analysis. You know, just like analyzing water. Now you analyze wine, jeez, and you can drink it. Huh? So, uh, so, and so, um, uh, so there, there it is. And so we also looking for someone to do this, okay? And the next project is called Vacuum Distilled Liquor. I don't know if you guys drink liquor or not. For me, I do. So I think a lot of things that I do is because of my hobby. But I like, you know, yeah, I like drinking a good whiskey every now and then and, and so on. And uh, so, but um, most, you know, right now, all of the liquor that being sold in the market right now are made using the traditional distillation method. Basically, you heat it up. So when you learn, when you take chemistry and you learn about distillation, we'll take a wine, right? Uh, and we heat it up to boil to make it evaporate and we condense it again back into, uh, and now we're condensing the alcohol, right? And of course, a lot of aroma in it and flavor in it, and it condenses and therefore it uh, have high alcohol content. And that's how we make liquor, right? By distilling certain wine or things that have low alcohol into hot liquor. And, but then the heating, that heating process right there, if you were to make uh, like liquor from fruits by heating it up, fruit, then you can see that it caused the fruit, the, you know, a lot of aroma in the fruit to change or in a way decompose, right? And because imagine eating a fruit after you boil it, it doesn't really taste good anymore. It smell and anything about it can change significantly, right? And so we know that, okay, if we were to make alcohol or liquor the traditional way and heated it up at high temperatures, it would boil, it would decompose and affect the aroma of the fruit. So, can we somehow do distillation without heating up the fruits? And if you take an organic chemistry uh, with me or, or have done it already, then you will have learned about vacuum distillation. So by doing, by applying pressure to produce a vacuum, you can now allow liquid, you can actually have liquid evaporate without heating it up. And now, so imagine distilling liquor without adding any heat at all, you won't be destroying all of that aroma, right? And essentially now your liquor will become much more flavorful. So that's the idea. And of course we have actually have made this uh, experiments and the data and you know, we're looking at some really, really good high-end liquor using this method. So I'm actually interested in doing a lot more chemical analysis on this using HPOC and GC and GCMS and doing a lot of analysis to show the, the difference between the two. And then hopefully in a way, try to, and if this is successful and it's good, then we're gonna find a way to basically produce uh, it commercially 
and hopefully can license this, right? And open up another company with your name and my name on it, right? And we could be selling very high end liquor, okay? Uh, uh, you know, because that right now doesn't exist uh, commercially right now, okay? So that's uh, my next project. And the sixth one, geez, uh, okay, well, I think I should go on too. Fighting fire with chemistry. So you can see that our state, we get burned, we get have Wi Fi every year, right? And I mean, the cost, it, it does tremendous for money to property and lives, human life, animal life, and all of that. This is very devastating, right? And so I would say that the, it have cost us like in the trillions of dollar due to all of this, right? And not to mention, you know, human life and all of that. And, and clearly the way that we're fighting fire right now is not effective. I mean, we can't rely on firefighters to come in and do what have they, we have been doing. They could clearly, our state still get burned up, right? So whatever solution we have right now is simply, simply is not effective. So what are the, my other interest is to look at, can we come up with find a normal way of fighting fire? And because here's what happened right here. We know that when you learn organic chemistry, you will then see that every reaction, if you were to, you, know, you can stop a reaction, inhibit a reaction or initiate a reaction by shooting it, by initiating it, by irradiating it with the right frequency, wave of the right frequency, right? For example, certain photoelectric reaction, when we shine light of the right frequency on it, the, re the reaction would happen. But then when we, uh, and then versus if we change the frequency to something else, it can inhibit the reaction. So basically what I'm looking at is can we somehow produce and you know, use that same reaction, right? But use that same method, and in this case, apply to a combustion reaction. So we basically look and we'll be looking for the interaction and the role of oxygen in combustion reaction, and see if when we expose it or when we basically you know shoot it with certain waves of certain frequency, what will happen to it? Is it will it accelerate the fire or will it suppress the fire? And then if this is successful later on, we will be attaching this machine to a drone and fly it around and wherever there's fire, then we'll be, you know, have that machine to be irradiating it with this, all this frequency right here. And hopefully that could be a new technology in fighting fire. Clearly a lot of ideas similar to this have been proposed already, but I don't think that there's one that have been, uh, that, uh, that have been done involving using waves yet to initiate or suppress chemical reaction, okay? And so uh, that would be my other interest. And lastly, the kind of analysis with Dr. Askin, okay? So if you're interested, then please meet me. And so I just wanna mention this again, that um, I have, I think normally in our normal research seminar, then toward the end of uh, the seminar, we stay behind to talk to students who are interested. So in this case right here, we can't really do it. So I have decided that toward the end of this seminar, I will create a group breakout group and then with, uh, with uh, Paul, with all five of us. And then if you're interested in any of our project, then you know, join our group. And so in case you have more questions about it, okay? So that will be the way to virtually ask questions. And now I do want to mention this, and this is also a message to all of the instructors too, that because right now we are down into the second weeks of the semester right now already, right? And technically speaking, today is the last day to, uh, to add students to classes. So if you're interested in doing this, then we will have to follow and we'll have to do the petition, but we'll get you enrolled, okay? And so in one way or the other, we'll get you enrolled, okay? And, but then I do want to be able to accept students as early as possible. And we want all the professors to do the same thing because uh, so that way we can get enrollment out of the way. So perhaps maybe by meeting with us after uh, afterward, you can talk to us or you know or, or have an email make sure you save our email so you can communicate with us okay but i will be in the breakout room in case you have any other question for me to the end of this seminar thank you and next maybe professor Hosage. yeah go ahead julian okay you sure bill because i don't have a meeting like you, you no sure? i'm good okay. yes okay so I'm allowed to share my screen? Yes, you do, you are. All right. So 
All right. Um, so some introduction, general introduction to all this. Uh, I really like what uh, Professor Atkins presented about the benefits of this class. And uh, please know that all those benefits applies to regardless uh, of the project that you choose. Okay. So my idea is um, do um, a little project doing analysis of caffeinated beverage, okay? So I'm sure all students and us who've been students once, we tried to pull along an online maybe more than once, and often uh, the result is that poor guy on the cartoon, right, right? All asleep on your books, okay? Or maybe even the day after uh, in class, uh, that, that is the result. And as everybody knows, a good, um, a resource that we can use to avoid or remediate that is um, drink caffeine in the form of a beverage. Okay, so caffeine may comes mainly from coffee, uh, but it's present in many um, other beverages. Okay, and there are so many options now out there that, like this um, uh, poor woman here, you may be asking, what should I choose? So there's uh, plenty of energy drinks, energy shots available in the market. That's, there's good old coffee in different, many different presentations, okay? So you may be uh, asking yourself the question of, okay, I want caffeine because I'm falling asleep um, while I study or in class or at work. So what is my best option? Uh, maybe your question is, uh, what drink will give me the, the highest shot of caffeine uh, per serving, okay? Or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum and um, you're kind of, you have a bad reaction to caffeine or you're trying to lead a healthier lifestyle and you want things with low caffeine, okay? So uh, staying with coffee, you may ask yourself, is decaf coffee really decaf, free of caffeine? Uh, what about tea? Does it have caffeine? What about green tea? What are, about herbal teas like yerba mate, which is getting now in fashion, okay? So all those questions you can uh, answer in this uh, uh, project, okay? Uh, doing the analysis of caffeinated beverages. Um, and so when I thought about this project, I wanted something uh, that could be pretty much or completed, not completed because, you know, a project can always go on, but uh, it can be, I, students can reach a point where they are satisfied with their work in one semester, or eventually it's a project that can be taken uh, for longer periods of time, okay? Um, so basically, um, the idea of analysis of kind of infinite beverages, I, um, chose a couple of references cited here from the journal of chemical education that have the advantage of being uh, methods that have been stated, tested, sorry, in a college uh, setting, okay? And the two options are doing caffeine by HPLC, high uh, performance liquid chromatography, which some of you may know, for those of you who have no clue, basically like any it's, it's an instrumental technique okay um and like any chromatography allows you if you um start from the mixture which is any of these drinks is a mixture of many things okay probably um uh, energy drinks are the simpler ones because they are artificially made with water added uh, caffeine added and a few other maybe sugar, some flavoring, some chlorines, a colony, and that, that's it. So the, any chromatography allows you to separate the different components, okay? And then uh, if it is an instrument, at the end of the instrument, there's always a detector, okay? That tells you when uh, something is being detected, okay? 
Um, so that would be an option. Then there's a simpler option, which is using uh, UV spectroscopy. Okay? So measuring uh, the, the amount of light absorbed by a solution that contains caffeine. And there's a wavelength, uh, like is shown here in that little pic there, that uh, correspond to caffeine and quantifying the, 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 the area of that peak, we can uh, know how much caffeine it is in, in each um, in each village. Uh, like I said, uh, the, the, the good thing the good things I like about this project is, I mean, all of us more or less drink some form of caffeinated beverage, beverage or we're trying to escape caffeine. So we're looking for non-caffeinated beverages, okay? Um, and then um, the samples are really easy to obtain. We can buy them or bring them from home, um, whatever we drink or whatever we like or whatever we're interested in, we can analyze. Um, like I said, the simpler ones are, um, would be energy drinks. If we go to coffee or tea, uh, the, the, the matrix, meaning the components, the variety of components present in those samples is much bigger. So that may require a little bit more work uh, to really identify the caffeine in those drinks, but it could be part of the project, okay? Um, so that's pretty much the idea. I wanted to keep it uh, quick and simple. Um, so if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, just contact me. That's my email. I saw my email is also on the uh, application form. And if we are all staying on break rooms after this, uh, I'm, I hope I get any interested students and any questions you may have, I can, I can answer to you. Thank you. All right, does that leave me? Is it my yep. turn? Yep, thumbs up. All right, so let me share my screen now. And, um, you know, our research program at Sac City College, it's a blessing for the faculty. I think it's a blessing for the students. Um, or I know, you know, I know it's, it's a blessing for us all. And so it's, I'm excited to be part of this. Uh, you can see that the projects run, ooh, there we go. You can see that the projects run the gamut from um, very complicated technical analysis, uh, very technical um, organic synthesis type projects uh, done by many of my colleagues, uh, detailed uh, analysis, quantitative analysis. And then there's my project. My project is um, using very simple materials and um, so at a very low cost. And in fact, um, that's sort of my design. So, um, um, so low cost. And in fact, uh, my research projects have in the past, uh, some of them have been able to be done uh, online. So at home using uh, Chem 400 um, when we had lab kits at home. Um, and uh, so what I'm gonna be describing today is uh, when, so a project that we're working on now says, when does 100 milliliters plus 100 milliliters not equal 200 milliliters? And uh, this is true. This is, and well known, by the way, this is nothing that I'm coming up with. If you take 100 milliliters of uh, 2-propanol, which is also called isopropyl alcohol, and you add it to 100 milliliters of water, you do not get 200 milliliters of solution. You actually get 192 milliliters of solution. And um, two propanol water uh, solutions are uh, are very are you know can are oftentimes used as hand sanitizers. And uh, I don't get any money from this uh, this Dr. Bill hand sanitizer. This was just the one that I found online. Um, but uh, I wish, huh? Um, and, but, and hand sanitizers are a big deal, right? So making, you know, you can go online and see how to make your own hand sanitizer. Um, and usually it's, you know, the, the, the active ingredients 
is either the two propanol or you also see a whole bunch of hand sanitizers that just use flat out ethanol. Um, and that's because they kill the bacteria, they kill um, the viruses and things like that. And if for anything having to do with that, that sounds like biology, that is not my field, but that's what they tell me anyway. Um, so uh, what equipment do you need to do this research? Very simple stuff. Uh, you need a jeweler scale. Um, and actually they're not $15.99 now, they're down to $12.99 from Amazon, <laughs> I'm happy to say. Um, a plastic labware kit and a handheld refractometer. And so uh, out the door, we're all talking under 60 bucks, not including the chemicals. Um, and even the chemicals are relatively common and not that expensive. So this is um, simple research. And we, we've had a good record of uh, getting publications. And so uh, I'm excited to talk about that uh, if you'd like to. Uh, what does our research data look like? Well, uh, this is actual data from um, some of the students that have worked on this project before. You put it on the scale of a beaker, you add some water, you add some 2-propanol, you now have a binary solution. Binary means two things together. And then you measure what's called the percent bricks using this refractometer right here. And you have to mathematically convert percent bricks into refractive index, but that's a well-known correlation. And um, then we'll talk about that more too. All right, so, but, but the, here's you know, another slide hopefully showing that this research can be done by all chemistry students from chemistry 300 all the way through organic chemistry. And uh, so that's, that's one of the, the good things I think about this research is relatively straightforward. All right, uh, what type of data do we collect? Well, I told you that we collect uh, percent bricks, but then we use a mathematical equation to turn it into refractive index. And so this is what our data looks like. So the green dots, this is actual data from our group. And again, there's nothing new about collecting this data. This data has been collected before and our data looks exactly like the literature data. But, um, and, so then the question becomes, why are we doing this if it's been done before? And the reason, so similar to some of Dr. Atkins' work where she is developing a lab to do in Chemistry 400, our idea is that we are doing this in a new way that students in general chemistry can do. And so we're developing a Chemistry 400 type lab as well. Could be Chemistry 300, could be Chemistry 400, it could be done at any level. And in fact, our labs, we pitch them that they can be done in high school because they're relatively inexpensive as well. So again, nothing we're doing is new. Well, actually, that's it's not true. We have actually have some ideas um, that are new, but right now what I'm presenting has been done before and we're just doing it. I guess the first thing that's new is we're doing it with simple stuff that can be done at home or in a chemistry lab for very inexpensively. So normally to collect this type of data, people use much fancier instruments. And I can say more about that later, but. Now, uh, one of the reasons this is interesting is because it's a curved line that, that this um, refractive indices follow instead of a straight line. And that makes this what's called a non-ideal solution. And so a non-ideal solution is a solution which physical properties of the solution do not vary linearly between the pure component properties. An ideal solution does vary linearly. And I can draw the analogy between an ideal solution and an ideal gas, right? Ideal gases act ideally. <laughs> and the fact that these green dots are not along this dashed line means that this is not an ideal solution. And so that's one of our interests. And in fact, where we're going with this is we're going to look at mixtures, solutions that nobody has looked at before. So that is the new part. But this is, so we're de developing a lab and we're able to use this technique to look at new solutions, new binary solutions. Well, uh, a side note here, what is the refractive index? Well, you may know, but it's not, a not discussed a whole lot in general chemistry. Uh, it is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a material. So for water, it's 1.3332, generally accepted value. 
And that means that compared to a vacuum, which is pretty close to air, that light moves more slowly in water. And that's what gives rise to this sort of bent or disconnected spoon here when you put it in water. And uh, why does it do this? Well, light interacts with the electrons of the atoms. So that sounds like chemistry. And these interactions slow down the light. Okay, well, here's a little bit more. This is a nice clean example. And oh, I do, <laughs> there's no photo credit here because this was taken on my kitchen countertop at my house. So I guess it's my picture. This one I actually got from Wikipedia. And it's, it's a much nicer, much cleaner example of light coming in, refracting as it goes through a sample of plastic. And um, that's the same thing that's happening with the water. This is just a much nicer example of it. And it leads to some interesting things. And uh, my favorite, so again, this is something I recorded um, about how to make things invisible. And you can match the refractive index of a solid to a solution. And so what this video is going to show is for water and corn oil, uh, basically Wesson, but this was specifically corn oil, if you put a stir rod, a glass stir rod into it, well, uh, let's see what happens. So the stir rod appears to disappear, <laughs> appears to disappear. It does disappear because the refractive index of the glass stirring rod is nearly identical or identical to the refraction index of the corn oil. And so anyway, that's just a fun thing that uh, we came up with because to, to help motivate why refractive index is interesting, okay? Oop. All right, so uh, what do we do with our refractive indices? We use the refractive indices to calculate something called partial molar volumes. And partial molar volumes is actually more of a physical chemistry topic, um, which is a junior level chemistry course, but we, we, we sort of slow it down and make the calculations doable. Well, before we can talk about partial molar volumes, let's talk about what is just the molar volume. You probably are familiar with the molar mass. Molar mass is the grams per mole. Well, the molar volume is the milliliters per mole. And it's very easy to calculate. You take the molar mass, this is for water, and you divide it by the density. And uh, as my students will tell you, I love canceling units. And look at this, you get the grams to cancel here. Milliliter is in the denominator of the denominator. So it ends up in the numerator and you get molar volume units right there. And uh, you can do the same thing. Oh, shoot. Um, I apologize. The rest of my talk is about 2-propanol. This, uh, I had another version of this talk with ethanol. So this is ethanol. It's similar for 2-propanol, but um, ethanol has a larger molar volume. But all you need is the um, molar mass and the density to do these calculations. Well, what happens, uh, or let's talk about the partial molar volume. The partial molar volume is the molar volume of a substance when it is mixed with another substance. And in an idealized world, you have this huge vat of, uh, we're back to 2-propanol now, 2-propanol, and you put in one mole, because you can weigh it using our simple scales. You put in one mole, you weigh it out, of water into this. And what's really cool is that instead of taking 18.07 milliliters, it actually takes 14.5 milliliters per mole, a 20% smaller volume than if it's just pure water. And we have, so, and what's interesting to me is there's so many things that are interesting about this, but one of them is, Nobody knows why exactly this is, why this happens. Nobody. People are making hypotheses, but if you ask a PhD chemist why this happens, they will start waving their hands and they will scratch their head a little bit and they will say, because of the structure of the fluid. And you say, well, what does that mean? And they'll say, I don't know. 
So there's, it's interesting to think about how we can make such a simple measurement in lab at Sac City College that nobody understands why it is. But one of the applications of our work is we are systematically going to measure this property for different materials. And we are hopefully going to make suggestions, simple ones, about why this is, and maybe advance the field of science a little bit. I don't know, we'll see. But it's all based on very simple measurements using very simple equipment. Well, the effects are small. I mean, 20%, not that big. Um, but uh, so why do we care? Well, uh, the effects are small but measurable. If we go back to my original Dr. Bill antibacterial hand sanitizer, uh, and I don't even get money for promoting it, um, but it says it's 59 milliliters in this bottle. You can see it's isopropyl alcohol, which is 2-propanol, 70%, and it's basically some water, some glycerin, and some couple other things. Well, if you mix just the quantities that you think together, you won't get 59 milliliters, you'll get 57. So you have to add a little bit more to get the proper volume. You have to account for these effects of non-ideal solutions. Uh, so, and you say, well, 59 versus 57, who cares? Well, who? Uh, I don't know if you, <laughs> I remember this, uh, November 30th, the year 2000, a man in Reading actually found that Heinz ketchup bottles were short of the 20 ounces that they said they were going to have. How much short? Approximately 1%. But every single bottle, so he, he, I don't know how many ketchup bottles he opened, but it was funny because he actually sued. And I mean, this went, this was a uh, California attorney general was involved. Um, anyway, it ended up costing uh, $650,000 because Heinz in California, because it was specifically California actually, had to add extra ketchup for like a year to their bottles just to make up for it. And then they had to also pay $180,000 in civil penalties. Um, so small effects can lead to big problems when you make thousands of gallons of stuff like ketchup or hand sanitizer. So, um, so these are important. And, and these, there's a whole journal that catalogs these types of non-ideal solution properties. Anyway, I thought this was pretty cool. Now. Um, I'm looking for two students to join my group for spring 22. Uh, it would be great if you could go continue on after in uh, uh, going forward, but I'm just looking for uh, people who can do spring 22. You'll be hardworking, willing to enroll in Chem 484 or a Chem 495, I don't care actually, but we're willing to take the course. Uh, willing to be on campus on Fridays for three hours minimum. I think, I think that's what we're doing it, right? Is it, is it gonna be on Fridays still, Ben? I hope I have that right. Yeah, okay. Uh, students from underrepresented groups are encouraged to apply. And uh, it is my intent to present materials and activities in this group that are respectful of all these categories. And, uh, you know, as been mentioned before, not just about research, but for me, for and in general, your suggestions uh, are encouraged and appreciated. And uh, I'm going to be able to stick around uh, for a breakout room afterwards. This is the last slide for me. But I also have some, um, some information at this website uh, going back uh, five or six years even with the different projects that we've done. This is just the latest project that uh, our group is doing. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I turn it back over to Ben, I believe. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. That's a very, and thank you, Julian. That was some, and the volunteer and Tony is not here, but thank you to all of you for presenting today about your research. And so I did actually forget to mention about the deadline in case you're interested, when is the deadline for the application? So we know that we kind of right now is really late, like, you know, second week of the semester already. And so we want to proceed with this as quickly as possible. So basically, and we actually make the application easy for you to fill, right? So it should only take maybe 10, 15 minutes for you to submit your application. And so we ask that you submit this by Monday evening, okay? 
Monday evening, get that into us and by email in the professor. Okay. And afterward, hopefully you're going to hear back from the professor very, very quick. Uh, so we can get you enrolled. And then perhaps maybe if you are applying and then perhaps maybe you should also be anticipating uh, coming onto campus next Friday to meet with your professor in case needed. Uh, so we can start working immediately. Okay, but I think I'll go to get enrollment in, uh, uh, by Monday and maybe or by Wednesday, we'll be able to respond and say, yay, you are accepted. And then on that, on Friday, then we'll be having started a meeting, whether it's in person or through Zoom, but then to talk more detail about the research work. Okay, so we clear up that deadline. Are there anything else that are there any question, general question for all of us while we all are here? Or for the professor, are there any author, you know, are there anything that if there's anything that I missed? If I do, please, uh, you know, please do uh, share. So, first questions, any questions? Uh, uh, Yahoo, I think, you're, yes, you are muted, please, please go. Yes. Um, so, we just send the professors that have registered our application. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. If not, then let's. Uh, well, uh, and okay, more question. Please go. Oh, last question. So uh, it's basically going to be for free. We're going to do it for free, correct? Uh, so you do have to sign up for the class and be getting one unit. So I think there's a small fee that you might have to pay depending on your financial aid situation. Okay. But I think that there is a one unit, uh, and I think there may be a tuition fee for that. And I'm not too sure about the tuition fee, but I know that there is one unit, okay? And of course, most students have their tuition cover, so I don't know if that is your case, but then that's what it is. And as for the rest of this, they, we will pay for all of the re reagent and all, well, actually, uh, I, I, except for Professor Mueller's projects, which I know that he far away, but then I would say that in most cases, our depart department don't have funding to have pay for the fees associated. So you don't have to pay to get uh, for chemical reagent and so on. All right, thank you very much. And Katie, questions? Uh, yeah, if you're interested in more than one project, potentially, um, can we apply to multiple ones? Uh, or does yes. that just cause like logistical nightmare? I, I would say that if you are interested in saying, you know, two projects with two different professors, send your application to both of us, right? In case you don't get accepted here, you get accepted elsewhere. Increase your chances, okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I did see, how about uh, Audrey, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, so if we're interested in um, like two or more, because each professor had like multiple different undergrad research opportunities on the application, there's no place to specify it. So would we just say which one we're interested in when we send the email? Uh, so there is, I would say send two separate application to the two different professor. Mm -hmm. I, I think, sorry, I think he's asking if he's interested in working with a professor that has multiple projects. Okay. Where in the application okay. he okay. can specify which project oh. he's interested in. I, I would say in this case right here, it does not really matter who you send it to. Okay. So if you if, if you're working on projects that will collaborate with two professors, just send it to one and well, and in the end you will be working on the same thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you, and thank you for, for that uh, correction. Thank you. Cher? Uh, how far back do you want us to go on our uh, unofficial transcripts? Like, do no. you want our entire college history or just like the last couple of semesters? If, if it, if I would say that, you know, uh, please upload what is current right now. And, and let's say that, you know, if you, have, uh, if, if, if you have uh, a whole lot, uh, maybe a, a two years, if you have a whole lot more, then I think maybe this two years of transcript will be good enough, okay? Yeah, what we're most important in is uh, uh, what happened recently, you know, what happened in this, what class are you taking this semester? It may be several semester ago. So 
but not so much more than that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there's one question here. Um, yes, son. Hi, sorry. Um, I I see that Dr. Miller put his link for the application in the chat, but I don't see the application for like the general. I think that's like, the application. That's the sorry, Aeson. I'm just going to jump in here. That is the application uh, in general for every uh, project. I just keep posting it because um, I just want to make sure everybody can see it. But it, it should be. I put the link to my group's research. That's separate. But the application, I think, is for everybody. Yes. And yes, and yeah, we did it put in a link multiple times. So hopefully that uh, you'll be able to see it. OK. Also, Professor Dow put a link there. For yes. the applications, so I guess it's the same application you can choose. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same. I actually downloaded it, but somebody wanted me to post, wanted to post it again, so I just kept posting it. Okay. And okay, Sarah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I have more questions. Sorry, I just forgot to put my hand down. Okay. How about Joyce? Um. So in in the chat earlier, um, Doctor, I mean, okay, Professor Chuvik um said if you uh even if you didn't do great in chem classes you may do great in research so um i'm i'm pretty sure like you know not everybody did great in chem um for, for whatever reason so it's so you still want us to apply right and and well, in yeah. and it's not, yeah it's not us that want you to apply if you should apply and in fact we very very much encourage you to apply and you know, my experience with that, I was a horrible, I didn't do well in my chemistry courses when I was an undergrad. It was research that helped me change my view and help me, you know, uh, really see application to think and help me value my education. And therefore I did better because of research. So, and so if you feel, oh, I'm not doing too well in my courses, uh, does that mean I don't have a chance of getting approved? Then the answer is no, okay? We want because we know this and we, and we can see that this can change, can, can be a good change for quite a few students. In my case, happened to me, okay? And so don't worry about it. And then what we more worry more is your workload. I mean, if you take in like five other classes, then I think that it may be too much going on, but all than that, we're not gonna, you know, there's the multiple things that we look at and we do want to offer this opportunity for students even though that, you know, you didn't do well. If you are committed and you're really serious about it and you want to learn and about research and, and you think it'll be helpful for you, then that's something we'll be looking at. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, me, me too. See, see, this is an opportunity to, to upskill yourself, right? To get additional practical kind of hands-on skill with some of those instruments that you probably would never have gotten the opportunity to work with in, in, in some of your traditional chemistry course. So I, I would definitely echo that, that do not let grades uh, be a deterrent from you putting in an application. Thank you. And Katie, is that a new question? You gotta still see your hands up. Please go, go. Um, so I did hear that um, Dr. Miller had like his, the, expectation for the difficulty or whatever ex previous experience was like chem 300 chem 400 um for some of these other projects uh are there like significantly higher expectations as far as like previous exposure to classes or whatever I, I, I kind like, of... does it make no sense to like pursue I don't know, like um, DNA peptide stuff if you're in Chem 400? Uh, so in the past, I have done this experiment where I accepted a Chem 300 students into one of this project. And did this student learn from it? Then yes. And so, you know, you, although you have not have knowledge about organic chemistry yet, but by doing this research, it really, it, it, it helped you value uh, more and appreciate uh, understanding chemistry more. So when it's time for you to take organic chemistry, you will approach it in, in a very different perspective. And now you aim to understand. And so, uh, and, and, and you, it, uh, so 
to answer your question very, very, very uh, quickly, then no, we, 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 have, we, we do accept students even though if they are not, um, have not taken certain chemistry courses yet. Thank you. Did we hear from Alicia? Um, Alicia, did you have a question? Yes, um, I was asking, I was wondering if this recording will be posted somewhere after. Uh, so yes, I, I will get the recording and I will send it to Professor Dow. Um, and I don't know how to get it to everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I would say that if you're interested in the recording, please email us. So you have one of our email, maybe you can email me or you can email Professor Miller. So that way we know that you're interested uh, because I don't think that the, right now there's a place that we can post so all of you will be able to access it, right? And so I would say email us so that way we can send the link to you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any other questions? Wow, look, we answered a lot of questions. So I'm not sure if there will be any more questions in the breakout ses session, huh? But, uh, you know, I actually, so, uh, but let's do that. So uh, I do want to mention that, uh, well, actually let's break it out. Huh? Let's do the group breakout. So if you're interested, uh, you can jump around and you can choose which one that you want to join and you can start jumping around from one group to the other, okay? So I'll go for it. Maybe, course, maybe, you yeah. can name, maybe you can name them. Oh, okay, you yes. already did. All right, uh, great. Yeah. And of course, if you don't have any question, you are very, you can sign up. So thank you so much, everyone. It was a, it was wonderful to see everyone. And we have very great turnout. So thank you. Not here anymore, correct? Um, Professor Dow, another question. Uh, yes. Uh, so what if like you wanted, you're interested in. Hmm.